else can come late, but you'll get the benefit of being early. So, thank you, Bud, for coming this month, and everyone else. We are the, in case you know, you're in the wrong room, the Inventors Association of Manhattan. Uh, and uh, who's new here tonight? Who's the first time? Great. Well, you're in the right place if you care about inventing, or uh, you're trying to figure out how to get a product off the ground. We provide education, empowerment, and connecting for inventors, entrepreneurs, and startups of all kinds. Uh, the organization has been around for five years. Uh, started by the founder, Patrick Raymond. He happens to be sitting in the back. Uh, I became president of the organization this past January. My name is Bruce Zutler. Uh, I also operate. <laughs> no hackling. Um, I also operate a company called MCI Products Group, which is an organization which helps uh, inventors and companies uh, execute new ideas, uh, new inventions uh, by helping them plan, patent, prototype, produce, and find distribution opportunities. Uh, so this organization is a great extension of that in that I love empowering and educating people and helping giving them a safe place to learn more about the whole inventing process. Uh, we do that through guest speakers like we have this evening. Uh, the format is we're going to speak for about, oh, an hour or so uh, with Q&A. Feel free to, free to participate and ask whatever questions you have. Uh, we'll then take a break for about 10 minutes and go into what's called pitching panel. And is our pitcher here yet? I don't think so. Uh, and that's where we give inventors an opportunity to present their idea, their product, uh, their company for the purposes of exposure and feedback from a panel of experts. And that panel of experts includes our speaker, but also some professional members who support the organization. And I'd like to give a couple of them a chance to say hello. Gordon, thank you. My name is Gordon Randall Perry. Many of you have already seen me stand up and talk about what I do. I'm an industrial designer, and uh, I work with inventors to help you guys get your ideas forward. So I take it even from conceptual, just an idea in your head, I'll help you work it out. My fees are reasonable. I understand that money is tight. I always try to work with my clients to help out. And I'm right here in Greenwich Village, so please give me a call. Thank you, Gordon. Also, uh, our meetings are held here at Troutman Sanders, and uh, Louis Del Judas is the partner here at Troutman who uh, is kind enough to arrange this for us. Louis, please. Good evening. Uh, I'm a IP partner. I do patent drafting, prosecution, and development. Uh, I also have a company called Manhattan Design Group, which is a big firm. I own a partner in the firm, but uh, I have resources I can help. How it works. We know that out there there's a lot of people who may not be as reputable as they should be. So I'm happy to guide you the process of answering questions. Thank you, Lewis. So um, the inventing process uh, is a lot about doing new. And one of the things I've seen recently in working with some of my clients is that everyone is hung up about, I want to do something new and different, but you know, the result that they get is not the result they expect. And just a little piece of advice and something I like to give every meeting, uh, something I heard from uh, a young person who was very uh, insightful, that if you want to achieve results you've never achieved before, you have to do things you've never done before. And I found that quite profound, especially for this young person. And to me that was like, oh my God, you know, especially for inventors or startups, we all work from a comfort zone, which is where we tend to invent our product from, something we know. But to get the results we need to achieve might have to do with going out and speaking to collaborators you felt uncomfortable speaking to, uh, learning about marketing, uh, filing a patent and spending some money to get some protection. So I think we all get locked in that uh, quandary of what to do next. Uh, but in that spirit, and the title for tonight's meeting was uh, tips and tricks for getting your product off the ground. And we have a lot of expertise in the room as it relates to patenting, whether it's Lewis or some of our other professional members. Uh, but something that a lot of inventors tend to overlook is how to properly market a product. And I thought that a, a woman who I've uh, worked with in the past and has provided, provided good assistance to some of my clients is Dana Humphrey. And Dana is a recognized expert in PR and marketing. 
uh, has a strong understanding of the pet industry, but so many of the inventions that she has worked on has applicability to everyone's industries. So with that, I'd like Dana to come up and not speak too much about her stuff, but have her speak about her own things. Wonderful, thanks. Um, so this is a fun group to talk to. I like I like meeting with inventors. Um, I'll talk, talk a little about, my, about myself and introduce myself, and then we'll get into some different points about marketing and public relations. Um, we can open it up for questions at the end. If you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to write them down. and raise your hand at the end. So again, my name is Dana Humphrey. My company is Whitegate PR. I'm a Danish, Dutch, Canadian, American. And I've lived in five countries, visited over 50. I went to San Diego State University, go as techs, and <laughs> I have a degree in public relations. I started doing PR right away with some startups in San Diego and um, started focusing really on cause-related marketing and in the pet industry. Um, I worked with a wine company called Great White Wines and later Shark Trust Wines that really um, their goal and mission was to uh, promote the Great White Shark through the enjoyment of wine. Um, and then I, then I transferred into Muttropolis doing all their PR marketing and that's really what kind of got me focused in the pet industry. Um, I work with a lot of solopreneurs as we call them or pet Entrepreneurs, um, but hopefully some of the things I'm talking about applies to what you have going on as well. So I started White Gate PR and I moved to New York City. Uh, we are a marketing and public relations firm that works with authors, nonprofits, um, all different types of industries, but we really specialize in the pet industry. I also teach at FIT in the Pet Product Marketing Department. Yes, there is one. Um, and Bruce has been a lovely guest speaker in the past. And I'm also a course instructor at NYC Business Solutions and 24-7. If you guys are not familiar with NYC Business Solutions, it's a great free resource for new entrepreneurs um, as far as asking questions, um, getting legal advice. Um, they have a lot of different options for all right, so let's get down to business. Today's topics, we're going to talk about guerrilla marketing 101, social media, networking basics, press releases, and the difference between public relations and advertising. So in light of what Bruce said, you have to do things differently to get some different results. Um, same is true with marketing and PR. Um, and, you know, same with making new products, right? Um, there has to be some kind of new twist on it to make it be interesting to the people that you're trying to reach. Um, so let's talk about guerrilla marketing, right? The first thing that you need to identify once you have your new product or service, right, is who is your target audience. Once you identify who your target, tar does anyone know what a target audience is? It's their someone's demographic information, right? Does your product mainly appeal to male, female, um, age 30 to 50, or maybe 50 to 70? What's your target demographic? Once you decide those things, then you can start to plan how you're gonna reach those people. Okay, what are those people reading, watching, and listening to? Because um, that's how you're gonna get your message or your product in front of them, right? Um, so guerrilla marketing is kind of like a sneaky underground way to reach these people. Um, so we'll talk about a couple different options um, on how to do that. Meetup.com. How many of you are familiar with Meetup.com? A few of you, okay. Um, if you have a new product that is good, that is a book. Let's say you have a new book a good meetup group that you might want to join and interact with and learn to meet the members would be different book clubs on meetup, right? Or if you have a new, um, I don't know, toothbrush, maybe you want to meet with the meetup group that's very worried about germs. I don't know, <laughs> right? You figure out what type of group makes sense based on your target demographic and how, figure out how you can reach those people. Meetup has, you know, thousands, maybe even 
hundreds of thousands of different groups online sorted by zip code. So part of the process of finding out who your demo target demographic is might be what income level they're in, right? Is this a high, do you have a high-end product or a low-end product? Um, if your target audience is more of a high-end group, you might want to look at what zip codes in this country um, where high-income people would live, right? What zip codes are those in? Then maybe you go back to Meetup and you search by that zip code for the areas of interest, you know, that works for you. Um, if it's a very specific, if you have a very niche product, then, you know, reaching 500 of those people that is exactly someone who would want to have your product is maybe better than reaching 5 million of the wrong people. Something that's something I like to always um, reiterate is that it's better to reach five of the right people than five million of the wrong people. Um, so when you're looking at your marketing plan, you really, my, my focus is to make it as focused and niche and targeted as possible so that you know exactly where your target is and where you're going and how to reach your specific people. Then just kind of doing a buckshot approach and trying to reach everybody. Does that make sense? All right, so Meetup can help you do that. Um, if it's something here in New York City, maybe in the tri-state area, you know, maybe it's something that you can attend, start learning about your target demographic, or, um, you know, attending the group, getting to know the people, see who the influencers are. Um, or it's something that maybe you could even offer around the country. Maybe you can offer discounts to different groups um, just via email on meetup.com. You don't actually have to live in that zip code and, and visit that, that zip code. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Okay, great. Um, for those of you who are not, that's your homework assignment. There's one thing you take away from this presentation is that you should get on LinkedIn. Um, you can create a free profile. You can invite clients friends, neighbors, people you've worked with in the past to recommend you, um, and connect with anyone that you know, right? Um, the more pe people that you connect with on LinkedIn, the more of an online personal brand that you've created, which is going to help you in your new steps as launching a new product, being a business owner. Based on whatever you have going on in the past or in the present, maybe you work full time and you're also starting a new product. Um, a lot of people ask me, Oh, should I have, you know, three different LinkedIn profiles, one for when I was a banker, one now for when I'm a chef, and one for my new product? No. It's 2013. You're one person. People do a lot of different things. Um, and you never know. Maybe that person that you used to bank with when you were a banker 10 years ago, his brother is a manufacturer in China that can get you exactly what you need to make a new product. You never know what connections are going to come along the way that can help you. And the more recommendations that you can get, not endorsements, actual recommendations from people, will help you in your process as you're trying to create your new business. Right? People want to work with people that they like and that they trust. So if you have some third-party testimonials, people basically saying that, yes, you're a good person to work with, it's going to help maybe open up that door when you're in a new new territory, right? Maybe dealing with new manufacturers, new patent attorneys, different people that you're not usually used to working with. So social media is part of the guerrilla marketing strategy. Whether you like it or not, uh, social media is not going anywhere, okay? Probably these pictures I have up here, of different logos of different social media platforms will change over time but social media is, is not going anywhere. Um, I'd like to take a minute to have you watch a quick three minute video about social media. I think it's pretty impactful.
the control. by the way, there's uh, beverages in the back of the room, and please feel free to help yourself.
Wow. Amazing. Is everyone blown away by that? So there you go. Um, so any of you who are thinking, oh, social media is not for me, unfortunately, or fortunately, it is. If you have a new product, um, you either need to get on board with it, or thank you so much, or um, you know, have someone on your team that, that knows what they're doing with social media. Um, the main thing I like to say about social media, and that's a whole other longer course, um, is that it's social. I think a lot of people think that they need to be constantly promoting their products on different um, vehicles. Really when it comes to social media, what I recommend is that you really pick the tool that you understand and that makes sense for you and reaches your target demographic and you do that well. Instead of, I think a lot of uh, new business owners or someone launching a new product kind of has this anxiety about social media, right? There's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's YouTube. What if I don't have a video? Well then you don't need a YouTube. Right? But maybe you should you know, have a plan to get a video at some point so that you can be on YouTube because Google owns YouTube and highly ranks that content. Um, and I think a common, um, common mistake people do is, new business owners do, is constantly um, tweet about their products, Facebook about their products. Really, in general, when it comes to social media, you want to use the 80-20 rule. 80% okay, of the time be giving good, valuable information, and 20% of the time promoting your products. Okay, That's a great rule of thumb for any form of online marketing, whether it's email blasts, or Facebook, or Twitter. Um, an example would be if you're at a party, or even maybe at the drink session of this, um, at this evening later on, and someone comes up to you and starts telling you about what they do. And they're talking, and they're talking, and they're telling you about themselves, and how cool their product is, and they don't ever ask you about yours, or really have any interest in what, what you have to say, or ask you any questions. At some point you're going to tune out, right, or try to get away from that person, and think, okay, I'm going to go get another drink, or I'm going to go meet this other person. You tune out. Social media is the same way. It's social, okay, it's about talking to people not having a one-way conversation with someone um, because they're not going to listen. Okay? It's about being engaging. It's about being interesting. It's about providing at least 80% of the time good quality content that people want to read and listen to and watch. Whether that's a photo or a video or a news clip or a quote, um, it's finding that nice mix that your target audience will respond to and look forward to. Um, so that you can stay top of mind. Um, something else real quick is that in marketing, it used to be that you had to make seven touches with your brand. Um, so someone had to experience your brand about seven times before they would start to recognize what your brand is. Today, because we receive over thousands, over a thousand messages every day, um, it's 12 touches. So you want to make sure that all of those touches count, right? That they're consistent, that your brand is always portrayed in a consistent way. Um, that your logo on your website, on your business card, on your brochure, on your Facebook, on your Twitter is cohesive. And that when someone looks at your brand or looks at your logo, they know exactly what it is that you do or what it is that your product does. And that also goes a little bit deeper even into what your product is called. Right? What's your product going to be named? What's your website URL going to be? Um, all of these things sync together that will ultimately help if, if your brand is a success or not. Um, you know, you can have a great idea and even have it manufactured great, but if no one knows about it or your target audience doesn't know about it, it's not going to be a success, right? Dana, I have a question yes. that might be on topic or not. In that video, there was something there that struck me about uh, universities are not giving students emails. And I've heard that email is almost going away. Yeah. So if they don't have an email account, how do they communicate with each other in a way that can sure. be private because it seems like everything in social media tends to be public? Sure. Well, um, something that I find interesting is that a lot of people think that, oh, you know, email marketing, 
that's just for young people. Actually, email marketing is most effective with a 65 and up market <laughs> because people that are 65 and over actually use email more than the group of people that are 65 and younger because that's how they communicate. They, that crowd, um, the 65 and over crowd has been taught to get on the internet bandwagon and they have an email and they communicate via email. If you look at someone who's 20 years old or younger, they may not have an email account. They may just have an email account so that they can set up their different social media logins. So how are they talking to each other, right? They're, they're texting each other. They're calling each other. They're Google Plusing each other. They're inbox messaging each other on Facebook. That's probably the most common way. Um, and it is a private message that they can send to each other. Um, so with all these new tools that are constantly developing, people are communicating in different ways. Um, whether it's you know sending a photo to each other on, on Instagram or Pinterest, or sending an actual text message via Twitter to each other, maybe as a direct message. So the same communication is happening and the same word of mouth marketing is happening, right, that's always been there, it's just happening in a different way. Instead of you know meeting up at a at a location and having a conversation, that's what, that word of mouth marketing has been translated into communicating in the channel that you prefer communicating with. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Quick question: How do you once you've determined your demographic, how do you figure out which social media? Sure. Media so that's a whole that's a whole nother topic. Um, Pretty much. Um, so let's look. Let's look at these real quick. Okay, if you have a brick and mortar location, like a physical store, then you want to be on Yelp. If you have a product that needs to be explained <coughs> visually or with videos, you should be on YouTube. Um, if you're B two B, business to business, you need to be on LinkedIn. Uh, if you want to reach bloggers, if bloggers are really important for you to reach, you want to be on Twitter. Um, if your product is very visual or you have great photography that you want to get out there, you want to look at Instagram and Pinterest. Um, and Tumblr is kind of a cool new way to blog. So that's kind of like a basic breakdown of, of how to kind of decipher which tools might, might make most sense for you. Um, but again, it's kind of like if the same story as if you can take the shorter way or the way that you know. Which way is going to get you there faster? It's usually the way you know. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't experiment with new social media tools because two months from now, this screen is going to be probably a different screen, right? But the message is the same as far as being social, communicating with people in a way that they want to be communicated with. Um, Pinterest is actually um, one of the most um, beneficial ways that you can make money on social media. Okay? The other, these other tools are very good for brand awareness and all of that great stuff. Pinterest um, is directly coordinated with sales, um, more so than all of the other social media tools. The reason why that is, okay, let's say you have your, you make, design a new shoe, you're a shoe inventor, you have a special shoe that does something new and interesting. If I find your shoe and I think it's cool and I want to put it on my Facebook, I'll just put a picture of it and it might get a lot of likes, it might get shared, right? It might be taken um, to other places. But on Pinterest, if I, if I post a link back to that same shoe, it has a track back to the um, e-commerce store where I can buy that shoe. Um, and so there's actually more direct sales from Pinterest. Excuse me. Yes. That's mostly a female demographic, though, isn't it? Sure. Did you say earlier. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So again, you need to look at your your target demographic and see which you know which tool is going to make the most sense for you. <coughs> um, which, which, what would be good for a male demographic? If you wanted to sell direct. Direct to consumer male demographic. I guess Facebook. Um, possibly Twitter depending on what type of product you have. Um, all right, let's talk briefly about cross-promotions. 
Um, I think that aligning yourself with other businesses that make different products that target a similar demographic is, can be very, very effective. Um, so for example, you decide that Facebook is the way to go for you and you have built your Facebook following over time and you have 1,500 <coughs> fans that are very active on your page. They're very responsive. Um, you might want to find another brand that's in a similar place as you as far as where they're at in their growth um, and partner with them. If you make you know, shoes for men and someone else makes pens for men, maybe you do some, some cross promotions together where you recommend their things and they recommend your things. Um, it can be really effective for a startup or a new business when you don't have a lot of advertising dollars. right? It's a win-win for everybody involved. Um, maybe you want to do a Facebook contest, right? <coughs> it's really popular these days. Um, usually what people do when they make a Facebook <laughs> contest is the prize is one of their products. What might be more motivating as a prize is a different product that people want. And that's maybe how you can also work in the cross promotion. Right? In January, your the pen company promotes the shoes and in April, vice versa, however you want to work it. Um, but aligning with other strategic businesses that reach a similar target demographic than you but don't offer competing products is a really, really smart way to build your business. Um, for Real quick about um, social media and scheduling. Um, there's two tools that I can recommend about scheduling posts on social media. Um, social Oomph is kind of old school. It's great for Twitter. Um, there's something new called vbout.com <coughs> um, that's great for scheduling any type of post, um, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn. I wanted to mention uh, in cross promotion. And yes. Another strategy might be uh, I, I have a I know a few people that uh, connected with um, charities. Yes, absolutely. And so it's like they offer <coughs> promotion of the charity and what the charity is doing on, on their Facebook page, and then the charity lists them as like fantastic people to buy things from on their page, I guess. Um, is probably the shortest way of playing, but uh, I've seen it a, a few times. Yeah. Um, how many of you are thinking of having a charitable partner for your new product? A few of you, okay. Yeah, you want to leverage every partnership and every opportunity that you have. Um, it's also stronger, right, to, to plan and pick one specific charity that you're going to work with then donate to 20 different random events throughout the year. Um, both things have their benefits, but um, you know, having stronger, deeper connections with um, <coughs> specific organizations can be help your brand more in the long run. If you want to look at like Tom's Shoes or um, in the pet industry, this is very common. Most most brands um, donate 10 percent of proceeds to local shelter groups. Um, if they have a you know, if that whole 10% goes to one shelter group, then you have full support from that shelter group, right? But if you're putting, if you're doing 10% all over the place, then you have like a little bit of support from all these different groups. Um, you know, so again, you want to um, try to identify what type of charity partners appeals to your target demographic and go from there. It doesn't even necessarily have to be something that is uh, relevant to your industry or what products you make as long as it's the right people. All right, so let's talk about email marketing real quick. Um, so you know that if you have a target demographic of people 65 and over, email marketing is for you. Um, the, ROI on email marketing is still very high because it's relatively inexpensive to do and to produce and you can still have pretty good results. Um, interesting how things are changing. Um, I used to very, very strongly not recommend any form of direct mail. I think that that is changing. 
think that it might be making a comeback because now we don't get junk mail in our mailbox, we get it in our email box. Um, however, you, again, 80-20 rule. If you're, if you're emailing people, <coughs> hey, here's my new product, every single time, they're going to tune out and they're going to stop reading your emails and they're going to unsubscribe. But if you have interesting, new, fresh content with tips and recipes and videos and actually good information maybe about your industry that people want to read about, that your target demographic is interested in reading about, they'll open your newsletter at least every once in a while, right, so that you stay top of mind. Really the goal with all of these initiatives is to stay top of mind so that when, maybe it's three years from now, somebody needs to buy whatever cool invention that you made, they remember where to get it. Jana, I, I get asked a lot by people, if I have 10,000 followers <coughs> on Facebook or I have an email list of, what is a reasonable yield to expect, like if you were to go <coughs> to promoting something? Is it one out of a thousand that you would hope to want to buy something? Is it one out of a hundred? Is it one out of 10,000? You know, what's the ratio? So it's really, as much as it is a numbers game, it's also more about how involved they are. So having 10,000 Facebook fans, you could get zero sales. You could have a million Facebook fans and get zero sales from that. Um, it's really more about how <coughs> engaged those fans are. Um, I don't know, some of you may not know this, but you can buy fans on Facebook. Um, so if you buy 5,000 fans and now you have 10,000 fans, great, it looks good. But, um, you know, are you going to yield anything from those new 5,000 people that you just bought? No, because they don't care. They didn't even come to your page to like it. They've never even seen it before. Somehow they, they got to, to like the page. So um, I'll give you an example. One of my clients um, has been doing their social media for a couple of years. It's really been built up over time. The company's been around for 20 years, and it's called Sturdy Products. And people that buy from sturdy products are really kind of hardcore sturdy product users. Once they're in, they're in. And they're very um, committed to their pets and to shopping. And the Facebook is around 4,000 fans. Um, it's not huge, right? It's not a huge amount. <coughs> but the Facebook page is, is um, the number one way that the website gets sales. Um, there's a huge interaction from the customers from all around the world that um, they help each other. If someone has a specific type of cat and they live in Russia and they're trying to figure out what to get, they'll put it, they'll ask it on the Facebook and someone who lives in Egypt with that same kind of cat will give them feedback about which product they should get. That's why you want social media, okay? It's for that third party testimonial so that it gets developed to the point that the fans are helping each other. As a social media admin, I don't need, I just get to watch, right? I just get to watch the magic happen and see people helping each other with their orders. It's like a whole new customer service team. And they're gonna believe the person that just wrote to them from Egypt more than they're gonna believe me, right? So it's really more about the interactivity that you can hopefully develop and create over time that makes a big difference. Um, that that does, your actually, question. it comes back to a point that you said about the touches. You know, yeah. It used to be the law of seven touches, <coughs> now it's 12. It's, so it's not how many actual fans you have or followers, it's how many touches maybe is the average of those fans. And once you get them up to that threshold, then they might be ready to yeah, exactly. transact with you. Exactly. Um, some of you may have heard about buying email lists, okay? You're getting into a new um, new sector. Maybe um, you have a new invention in a new industry that you're not familiar with. You don't know anyone that maybe is your target demographic. Well, um, I would really recommend building your own email list. Um, once you have email addresses, you can also <coughs> always translate that into different types of fans. You can directly invite them to like your page on Facebook. You can directly invite them to follow your channel on YouTube. 
So email addresses are um, very valuable to have, but you really want to try to build that list from scratch. Okay, if you start with 50 people, and then eventually you'll have 200, eventually you'll have 10,000. Um, but by building that list yourself, it's by actually physically meeting people, or having an event somewhere where you collect business cards, somehow creating that first touch so that when you follow up with an email, it's not, um, you have a starting place, okay? Um, <coughs> yeah, I think that's it for email marketing. So as you had mentioned about product placement, how do you get your products out there? How do you get them in front of your target demographic? Um, Maybe there's some businesses in the area that offer a service that somehow ties in with what type of product you have. Maybe you want to do some kind of cross-promotion with them. Um, targeted donations, right? Attend and cont contribute to silent auctions for events where you think your target audience is going to be. And you should probably be there, right? And maybe that's a way that you can build your email list from that. By um, and again, I want to differentiate that. So, uh, let's say you you um, do a benefit event with maybe a golf outing because you want to reach high net worth individuals, and you think that because they golf, maybe they have their high net worth. Maybe this is a good target for me to attend. Um, and you donate an item. Maybe in exchange, they give you the email list. That's all fine and well, um, but that is really not what I mean by building your own list. Uh, building your own list would actually be attending the event and meeting people there and building it that organically through those maybe business cards that you get. Um, if you do get a list from the organization of the different email addresses, you definitely want to follow the law and uh, send them an introduction email allowing them to opt in. Okay. Um, <coughs> I also meet a lot of new business owners that try to do email marketing themselves, some kind of BCC formula. Don't do that. Okay? Just don't do email marketing at all. You're breaking the law. You're going to get put in people's spam filters. You, you could get blacklisted. There's really uh, way more negatives than there is positives, and there's so many free email marketing tools or very low-cost email marketing tools. Um, MailChimp or Constant Contact are two. There's tons out there. Um, what's another way of product placement? Does anyone have any other ideas on product placement? Consignment. Consignment, okay. What about when people wear a t-shirt that says Coca-Cola? Is that product placement? Or that says Nike? Or if you wear, um, if you go to a trade show, right, and you get t-shirts made up with your logo on it and you stand in your booth and you have your logo on your t-shirt. It's product placement, right? It's some form of product placement. Um, it's also a similar idea with reaching out to bloggers, right? Mommy bloggers, daddy bloggers, grandma bloggers. There's bloggers out there. In my world, there's a ton of pet, blog pet <coughs> bloggers. There's actually conferences that they attend. So by having your product maybe highlighted or featured on a, bro on a blog, it's a a type of product placement. So how do you how do you get that, right? You need to think out of the box and think how you can reach those people. I recommend that um, you guys check out this website called Triber, right? It's about creating tribes um, of people. It's a sphere of influence within your community that maybe like your product. Maybe it's a blogger who writes about your product and creating your own tribe for your new brand. Um, something that the inventor of Triber started was he always wears a Triber t-shirt or he wears a t-shirt for his <coughs> clients that he brings on board. So a new form of product placement, I've been designing dresses with my clients logos on them and posing in photos and sending for the media as another form of product placement. How can you get creative with your logo and with your design and do something different that hasn't been done before so that it stands out and you stay top of mind. Um, part of, you know, part of launching a new brand, launching a new product, 
It's about networking. It's about meeting people like you're all doing tonight. So good. You know about networking. Um, for those of you who are maybe new to networking, you're not too sure how to get started, um, there's something called BNI you can look into. It's kind of like a networking 101 um, to kind of get you into the gist of it. Um, maybe you want to check out a Toastmasters. But meeting people, talking to people in person, in face, and practicing your 30 second commercial, or the which is basically the 30 seconds of how you explain who you are and what you do and what your new product is. Um, and then you follow up with them. Okay. Does anyone have questions about networking? Sort of questions and maybe a little bit, sort of touched on this before, Trevor. Um, you're talking about contacting or having bloggers that are interested in what you do. <coughs> Uh, I'm thinking about my products or the things that aren't in the market yet, and I think it'll be, I think for me, we'll be able to find um, our target audience through those bloggers will be really powerful. But I, I figured I'm just going to figure it out as I go along, trying to find the bloggers that are going to be my biggest proponents. Sure. Yeah. How do you engage those people? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I guess the first tip with bloggers is bloggers are people. They don't want to get an email that says, hey blogger, check out my new product. I guarantee that's not going to work. They don't, they don't want that. Just like if you would get an email like, hey product maker, you know, it's just, it's not personal, it's not engaging. Really um, the best thing to do is do your research. Um, so how do you even get started, right? You can just Google top 10 blogs in XYZ industry. See what comes up. Check those out. See if um, they would actually ever even write about the type of product that you have. Again, um, I think it's stronger to send one really great email to a blogger than 10 like random generic emails to 10 bloggers. Um, you're going to get a better response. Um, for example, in the pet industry, right, if I have a new treat that I'm trying to promote and I have a nice list of all these blogger, pet bloggers, and I send it to all of them, sure, that might have saved me a little bit of time, but it really wasn't that effective because I had a bunch of bloggers in there that I know don't ever write about health or nutrition or would never feature that type of product. So just doing a little bit of basic history uh, research about what the blog, what the blogger writes about, or what they like, can also help you customize what you send to them. So maybe they do like Wild Wednesdays, and they do something interesting. Maybe you can, like help them come up with an idea for Wild Wednesdays. You know, the more out of the box ideas you can come up with and help them, it's gonna, it's gonna work for everybody. Um, for example. A lot of bloggers like to do giveaways. Okay, great. So they'll write a review and then they do a product giveaway. It's kind of boring, right? Everybody does that. How can you work with them on creating like a really cool contest idea that's going to be their best contest of the year that everyone remembers and now you're top of mind? And maybe it's just working with two blogs, two bloggers really consistently and effectively than working with 20 bloggers <coughs> and like having some random links back to your site. Um, also, you might want to connect with them on Twitter, see what they're writing about, see what they're tweeting about. Um, if you can't get their contact information, maybe you tweet to them. That's really how Twitter, I think, is most effective, is reaching the bloggers that you can't always reach. Uh, sometimes they're not on, there's no contact information on their blog, um, so you can try that one. How do you determine the size of the blog you can just go to Alexa.com and type in the blog and check out their Alexa ranking. You can always ask them. What, what is that? That's Alexa? Yeah. Alexa? Uh, A-L-E-X-A. This works for every web any website. So this is also a good tool if you're talking to ESPN <clears throat> advertising department and they tell you, oh, yeah, we get 20 million visitors a month. You can just type ESPN.com on Alexa.com. And it'll say, oh, they actually get 15 million per month. Everyone rounds up. You can always ask them for their numbers. 
you can usually get a good sense from a blogger of how organized they are um, if you ask them that question from the beginning. They'll either tell you it doesn't matter or, you know, it, they don't know, it's this really complicated formula. That probably means they don't have very many <coughs> visitors, right? Um, but again, if, if the 40 people that do read that blog is exactly the right person that would buy your type of product, then it's, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it to talk to them about it. Um, I was working with a, a product launch for a specific type of device that you can put on a really old camera. So um, without getting into the specifics, it's something only for people that have a certain vintage camera that are professional photographers that would want this. It's very expensive. It saves the person a lot of money if they are into that. They're, the actual amount of um, people out there who would want this product is maybe 2,000 people at the most, right? But it's a very specific, very high-end um, product. So being on featured on a blog about something that has to do with this type of camera, if there's a blog that exists for that, is essential. Does that make sense? Um, all right, let's talk about press releases. How many of you have ever written a press release before? Oh, good, a lot of you. All right. So you, you already know the scoop. Just like um, your social media posts or any kind of presence that you have, your press release should be interesting. Okay? It should be newsworthy. It should be timely. It shouldn't be about something that happened last year. It needs to be in the correct format. And it needs to announce actual new news. If you don't have any actual new news, maybe you need to create something. Okay, maybe you need to make a, a strategic partnership. Maybe you need to partner with a charity. Maybe you need to have a launch party. Maybe you need to come up with something that's interesting news really timely so that you have a press release to write. If you don't, um, there's, you know, a reporter's not going to be too excited to, pr to produce your news. Um, correct format. Basically, the press re release is the tool that you use to explain what's going on with your brand and your company and your product to reporters. Okay? Sure, you can call them, you can email them, but really a press release is the way in which that they want to receive the information. Newsrooms have been cut over time. Right? Over the past couple of years, newsrooms are getting smaller. The reporter's job is getting more challenging. The, the better <coughs> the press release is that you give them in the way that they want it, the more likely they're going to want to work with you and produce your news. If, you, if this seems like something that you don't want to do, you can always work with a PR person. But you also want to make sure that um, that they feel, I guess, the same way about the importance of the press release. So here's just a couple of uh, formatting tips if you're going to be writing your own press release. Um, contact information, logo, okay? There's something called the dateline. It's a city in which the press release is coming from as well as the date that it's being released on so that the reporter can accurately judge if this release is timely or not. Something that you may have seen before on press releases is three hashtags at the bottom, three pound signs. Basically, the reason that that's there is that press releases used to be faxed to reporters. Now, fax is you know more irrelevant. No one really faxes anymore. And the faxes, if it was a three-page press release, the faxes would go through. The pound signs are at the bottom. The reporter knows they got all the pages. We don't really fax anymore, right? You can just email the press release to the reporter, or you can print it out and hand it to them, or how you can tweet it to them, however you're going to get it to them. Um, but you still want to put those three hashtags at the bottom, because it's kind of just following the formality of the press release. Photos is really where you can win with sending the press release. Once you have interest from a reporter that wants to cover your new product or service, you want to get them some really great photos, okay? And you don't want to waste their time. So if you give the reporter a great story with some great quotes in it from some industry experts, maybe 
um, a founder of a big company that has something interesting to say about your new type of technology or product, you've helped the reporter. Right now, they don't have to do as much research. They can just run with your release as much as possible. They're probably not going to run the release exactly how it is, and that's okay. But the more um, information you can give them, like statistics, industry statistics, quotes from industry leaders within the body of the press release, they're going to be more inclined to use it than using something that's just copy and pasted copy from your website. That's not a press release. And when you send it to them, make sure that the photo is high res. Um, this is something that if some, a reporter asks you for a high res image of your product and you send them a low res image, they might not even bother wasting time with you going back and forth about explaining to you what a high res photo is. Right? They're busy. They're on deadline. They're going to move on to the next story. Um, so this is something that trips up a lot of people when they're trying to do PR on their own, which maybe at first you might want to do. Um, you know, just make sure you get some of the foundations in place. Um, if you are trying to target a high-end person, a high-end market, then maybe you want to have lifestyle images, okay? People dress nicely with your product, right? Nice professional lifestyle type images. That again is going to help your chance of getting featured in a magazine, a newspaper, whatever you're, wherever you're trying to get featured in. If it's just a, pro a picture of your product on a white background, sure, that's fine too, right? It's hot, nice and high res. But the more interesting your pictures are, that would actually seem like they would appear in that magazine, it's going to be more likely of a fit. Um, what's the second point you had there about the original format and size? Um, it's better just to send them the whole image than try to like crop different parts out and send it to them. Uh, let them do the cropping. We have a professional team. Okay. Or, you know, maybe like sending it as like a <coughs> round image or somehow like some weird cropping. Let them do the cropping to, to see what's going to work best. Um, oh, something that I always like to try to tell you to think about is um, you can either be the fastest, the best, or the cheapest. Okay? cannot be all three. As you're developing your product, as you're thinking about your brand, think about those, you can be two of those things, okay? I'll let you be two of those things, but you cannot be all three. And that's also going to help you in your process of figuring out who your target demographic is. Is your product the cheapest, the fastest, or the best, okay? That, those, are, those are your options. So if you decide, okay, that's it, we're the best, then you need to price it that way. If you decide that's it, we're the cheapest, that's fine. Go ahead and price it that way. But know who your target market is and where they get their information um, and how you're going to come up with promotions that reach them, right? It's, if, if your goal is to be the cheapest, then you need to make steps to make your product the cheapest so that you can, you can handle those low price points. Where are you going to market that item? It's going to help you if you can identify one or two of those objectives. Well-written press release can help you. Maybe get new investors, okay? Um, get some new strategic partners. Um, it's an opportunity for you to basically say all the highlights and points that you want to make about your new product and service. Um, great, great publicity for you and new awareness from your target demographic um, if it goes into the right place. <clears throat> what is marketing? Marketing is the overall umbrella that has advertising and public relations inside of it. Okay? Here's the marketing umbrella. You have research, you have your advertising, promotions, public relations, and all of these great things combined, you get some sales. Um, I hope, as a public relations person, a lot of people um, maybe mix up the two, mix up public relations and advertising. There are different functions within your overall marketing plan. 
So based on your budget and the life cycle of your product, you're going to need to do a different mix of these things. So public relations is really um, spe a specific process of creating information for your target audience and making sure that it's, it's written in a way that is targeted to them so that you can reach them most effectively in the channels that they want to get their information in. Whereas advertising is more of a paid one-way approach to getting your message in front of people. I think in the video it said something like 14% of people are getting their um, ideas on what to buy from advertising. Okay? Advertising is, is getting less and less um, important, I guess, for <coughs> purchasing decisions. Just like if you're watching television, probably a lot of you TiVo things, right? You fast forward through the commercials. If you're on a YouTube video, you can skip the ad, right? If you're reading the Wall Street Journal, you know the difference between ad section and the content section. So really the goal with public relations is to get in the content so that what you're reading all flows seamlessly within the content versus a, a segmented, um, abrupt ad on the side. Um, this is just a fun little infographic about marketing. Uh, quality is the best advertising. Um, in marketing, you need to form an emotional connection, depending on what your product is. Uh, you need to measure marketing. It's really, really, really important. If you can't track it, don't do it. Okay? I'm going to say that again. If you can't track it, don't do it. I'm getting some blank looks. All right. So, any, any campaign of any kind that you have, whether it's an email marketing, whether it's on social media, whether it's um, a magazine article, or you want to have some way to track the results of that, whether it's Google Analytics, uh, maybe some kind of special coupon code. Um, if you do decide to do advertising, especially if you decide to do advertising, you need to have some kind of tracking system in place so that you know that you got one referral from that website that you paid to advertise on, or if you got 50 referrals. So that you can decide if that was successful or not, and if you want to do it again. Okay? Um, nothing happens without promotion. Um, be people driven. Okay? Understand the customer. <coughs> Reposition weaknesses into strengths. Write about problems and solutions. This is more important today than ever before. Being transparent, being um, vocal with the issues that you're experiencing, and being honest with your customers, so that you have um, you don't lose their trust, and you have a chance to perhaps fix the problem versus lose people. Um, <coughs> market the way that your prospects shop, and be creative and experiment. Dana, I think what's interesting, I don't know if anyone saw the names of the people that said some of that stuff, and the one about nothing happens without promotion, uh, P.T. Barnum. <laughs> so, but I think, and interestingly to me, and I don't know what everyone else thinks, but from what I do see with people I work with, um, they think that they're holding a lottery ticket and somebody's going to pick up their idea. You have to do something, whether it be the PR, whether it be advertising, whether it be email marketing, but some form of promotion to get the word out is essential. Yeah, you know, that's just my opinion from that list, but Absolutely. I think it's uh, you know one of the overarching messages that you have is that you got to do something. It's the same idea. Uh, I mean, the idea um, I guess that the Greeks had, you know, build it and they will come. No, that's not how it works anymore. There's so many competing messages going on that if you have something totally awesome that's you know stuck in the back corner here that no one ever visits. No one's ever going to know about it. And there could be a lesser product, right, that's maybe more expensive than yours and worsely made or less quality than yours that is getting all the exposure because they got the marketing piece right. You know, don't, don't let that be something <coughs> you don't plan for 
and that you don't put into your budget um, because you will need to promote your product. People are not just going to find it. Um, you know, even when when something happens with the New York Times, like how did someone in the New York Times, maybe a competition on the New York Times, they probably had someone contact the New York Times and tell them about their new product. And whenever the timing is right is when that piece will run. Um, <coughs> you know, again, reporters' times are, is limited. They don't have, a, they, they're not going to do like endless online searches to, and like find your product. You have to tell them about it. And that doesn't mean that they're going to write about it tomorrow, but maybe six months from now, they're writing a piece about cool new ideas and they remember reading your press release about some cool new gadget that you have that works in a roundup of 10 other products that they want to feature. Okay? That's how you win. That's how you win in, in that scenario. Um, so just a la few last things. Find your passion. Think outside the box. Keep it current. Location, location, location. Good luck. Thank you, Dana. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, in a networking environment, do you, are business cards still the way to exchange contact information, or is there some new paradigm? Sure. Um, there's definitely, you know, ways that you can like bump your phone and do that whole thing. Um, I still believe in the business card. However, um, you may have seen this before. Um, there may be a person in a networking event that's like, Hi, how are you? Here's my card. Oh, hey, I'm Craig. Here's my card, right? The speed networker, the, the um, you know, that's really just out in, in it for a numbers game. In general, my philosophy is really about quality over quantity. Um, so, you know, I would maybe avoid that person or say, you know, is that someone that you really want to network with, right, that didn't maybe even take the time to one five minutes about what you do before giving you a business card. Um, I just said before, the one thing I want you to take away from tonight is to get on LinkedIn. Um, I take, my personal process is I take all my business cards and I um, connect with people on LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn as my online Rolodex. Um, I'll give you a quick story about that. I do a ton of networking. I think networking is very, very essential. Um, I met a woman at a networking event that was a fire safety expert and she gave me and we talked for a while she gave me her card and about six months later a reporter asked me if I knew any fire safety experts that they needed like that afternoon about uh, for a TV segment they were doing about fire lucky for this woman who I still don't know what her name was I typed in fire expert on my LinkedIn her picture showed up I'm like oh yeah that's her her name pops up and her current contact information, her current phone number and her current email address. If I had to sit through and dig through some business cards, I wouldn't even know what I was looking for and I would never find it and I would, it wouldn't, that would never happen. I was easily able to send that to the reporter. It's great for me. It's great for me to have good relationships with reporters, right? And it's great for me to have reporters ask me who they should talk to. And this person just got, you know, hooked up of having a, a TV I have a friend. Yeah. And, you know, people change email addresses. People change their phone numbers. People move companies. Um, so sometimes you want to stay in touch with that person, but maybe even their their business card is not the most up-to-date information. Especially when women get married and they change their names. They oh. They find them by their name. Yeah. That's a great point. Do you want to talk a little bit more about LinkedIn? Sure. I, because you feel it's important, and I think it's interesting and important, too. Sure. So I can give you some examples. Yeah. Um, basically, you want to make your LinkedIn profile as complete as possible. Ideally, you want it to say 100% on the right-hand side. Um, if it says, you know, 85 and up, you're probably doing something right. Um, basically, your LinkedIn profile is an online version of your resume. Basically what it is. Um, but it's interactive and you can post, you know, you can post updates, you can, um, 
it's it's a tool kind of like how you have a website for your brand LinkedIn is a, a personal website for you and your professional brand as a person. Um, if you are interested in doing different types of things, people can find you. Um, and the more robust and complete your profile is, the more you're going to be found. Just like the basics of SEO. SEO is search engine optimization. Just like how if you have more interesting, engaging content on your website, Right? Google's going to find you more often and deliver you up more often and you're going to get higher up on the search. That's a good thing. Same with on LinkedIn. Okay, The more robust your profile is, the more en engagement you have, the more links you have, the more text and copy you have that's relevant to what you do, the more often you're going to get found when someone searches for you. Also, the more connections that you have, the more you're going to be served up when someone searches because um, that per the, le the less connections there are between you and the person searching, the more likely you're going to get, um, I guess, posted when you do a search. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, example. Um, Mid-July, I got an email from a woman in Ohio who's a security expert, and she wanted to talk about PR. Uh, we went back and forth. We set up a phone call. Um, and now she's a new client. I'm helping doing PR for her new book. Okay, we had one mutual connection. Um, it was actually not a very strong connection. These two women had met each other at a conference. They had connected on LinkedIn. Um, so it's kind of like taking that word of mouth marketing to the peripheral. You know, sh they didn't even have the opportunity to have a discussion of her, s of the security expert saying to the person that I know, hey, I'm looking for a PR person, can you recommend somebody? It just happened because she searched for a PR person. So now I have a new client. I have a lot of these types of stories um, of getting new business, mainly, you know, B2B via LinkedIn. Do you recommend a paid LinkedIn? Sure, it depends what you do. If you do sales, um, I, I don't have a paid LinkedIn account, I don't really need it. I think if you do sales, um, it would probably be a good thing for you to have it. Um, but it depends how, how you use it. Um, some people are open networkers. Okay? They connect with as many people as possible. I prefer to connect with people that I've actually met. Um, so that when I'm looking for someone, I can find them. Because that's how I use it. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that you can use LinkedIn. That's just kind of what, what I do. Um, there's someone here in New York City called Jasmine Sandler. She just wrote a LinkedIn book. She does workshops all the time. If you want to take a, a more in-depth um, look at, at LinkedIn for yourself. What's your take on crowdfunding? Sure. You want to do crowdfunding? I think it's a good idea. How are you going to promote it? Who are you going to tell about your crowdfunding? Who are you going to partner with that will help you get the word out about your crowdfunding? Um, what are you going to offer people that's motivating so that they want to support your crowdfunding? Those are all things to consider. Who could possibly What do you mean? Who would you partner with? Um, so, I just got an interesting one. Um, let me see if I can try to remember what it was. The, um, it's an organization uh, called uh, Life That's Inside. Okay, they they started um, in, like International Kindness Day, and they're all about promoting kindness and paying it forward. So um, what they offer is they did a big crowdfunding campaign. I think they met their goal, and they offered um, different products at different price points. Right, that's kind of the basics of crowd crowdfunding. But they partnered with somebody else who donated those products um, to be able to offer through their crowdfunding. And they got a lot of different partners to promote the overall um, campaign. Um, crowdfunding is a moment in time. And usually the campaigns are 30 to 60 days. So to think about crowdfunding as a solution is a great idea many times. But you have to really plan and prepare for your crowdfunding campaign and make sure you have those partnerships ahead of time. 
Uh, if you, some of the you know, larger sites are Kickstarter. I think a lot of us have heard of that. But uh, some people get disillusioned with crowdfunding because they think, oh, I'll put my campaign, my product up there, and the rest will take care of itself. Right. Doesn't happen that way. Right. You need to have a following because it's using social media to help you raise the money, getting back to the law of touches. You want to have some level of engagement and awareness with uh, groups of people or partnerships. Exactly. Just the same way as you, you know, it's about doing it right and planning it um, and getting the right partners involved. Whether it's Twitter or Kickstarter or Facebook, right? Just because you create it, people aren't going to just randomly do a search and like find you and be like, yay, I found it. It's not going to happen. It doesn't happen like that anymore. Okay? I don't know if it ever did. But you have to have a way, a plan that, okay, we expect that one in five people that visit our Kickstarter page will donate. We need to make uh, $10,000, so we need to invite 50,000 people to look at this page. Where are we going to get those 50,000 people from? Are we going to get 10,000 from our friend over here that makes, I don't know, a shoestring and I make shoes? Whatever it is that you can come up with some kind of partnership that makes sense for everybody uh, to help you promote that page. Whether, again, whether it's a Twitter page or your, or your Kickstarter page. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, I was listening to your, your great talk, uh, a lot of the uh, marketing or, or PR advice you were giving was in the event that you have a product for sale. Many of us as inventors don't yet have the product for sale. So the, the PR that we would want to do is pretty much to mention that we've got a Kickstarter campaign. Is that the news? Is that the offer we'd like to get a journalist to write about? Hey, Patrick's got a Kickstarter campaign on this great new product, but that's somehow newsworthy, in your opinion? Sure. So the fact that you started a Kickstarter campaign is not newsworthy. Right. But how can you plan it so it is? Right? Maybe you do something in Union Square where anyone who like uses your iPad and donates to your Kickstarter gets to send a healing balloon into the air that gets popped over there. What, whatever that's interesting and different that hasn't been done before that might be interesting to a reporter, then you get your story. But I'm saying that for someone who doesn't have anything for sale yet, maybe uh, sure. a patent application, maybe barely a prototype, how does PR help us? And I guess the answer is through crowdfunding. That's PR helps us make a crowdfunding campaign succeed. But otherwise, how does PR help someone who doesn't actually have a product developed yet? Per se? Um, well, so if your target market is, I guess, potential investors um, or other business people, maybe you want, maybe you do want to have a, sense, yeah. a story in like Forbes magazine. Right, where a potential investor might read about something that you have going on and, and connect with you that way, right? Whatever your goal is at that time. Usually, um, uh, someone like me, a PR professional, wouldn't get involved in the process until you're ready to go with your product. Um, and you actually have it already developed, you have a price, you have a website, you have a physical it's product. Yeah. It's ready. Yeah, whether it's e commerce only or whether it's you know, in stores or a combination or whatever it might be. However, all these same principles apply that if you want to make like a really amazing Kickstarter, you can. It, um, have any of you heard of um, Shave Shave Club of the Month? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a great ex example. They didn't use a Kickstarter, but they all they did was create a video. They created one video for YouTube. And it wasn't all about, it was like a funny, quirky video about this new Shave of the Month Club. It went viral, and it got crazy, and they really became almost an overnight success as far as like people signing up. So maybe, you know, based on who you're trying to target, what, where do they get their information, what are they trying to read, how can you tailor a press release about your Kickstarter to be interesting to that type of media so that you can get featured that way. Um, and, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity for coming up with cool creative Kickstarters that could be an actual in-person type of event that would then be maybe interesting to the media. 
isn't part of the answer to Patrick's question uh, that even though we don't have products yet, eventually we all the folks, the inventors, want to have products. So you, you're laying the groundwork. I mean, to me, all the things you're talking about take time. That they're not going to happen overnight. They're going to take weeks, months, maybe even years to develop, like a groundwork of connections and Facebook and Twitter and all that, so that when the product is ready to be introduced, then it, it'll be introduced in a fuller way. But wouldn't you agree with that? So that's really, I guess, why I stress LinkedIn, because that's really about, um, about you and, and working with you as a person, um, so that when you're ready to launch, let's say January 1st, 2014, some of that groundwork is there. You also don't want to waste any touches, okay? Um, you already have to get so many of them. You don't want to have any wasted opportunities. Uh, I really believe that it's important to be clear and consistent with your brand. And that um, if I meet you tonight and you give me your business card and it has uh, a, a logo on it and your contact information, and I come back six months from now to another meeting and I get a business card from you, and now you have your new product, and it has the new product logo and all that, all that jazz, it's a little bit confusing to me, right? As a person, you, oh, is this the same person? Oh, they have a new company. Um, as far as the social media is concerned, you would want to have it be specific to the brand. So if really I think the process is, um, you know, product, product name, URL, social media, and then your rest of your marketing materials. I think an in interesting order. perspective too, and partially to Patrick's question about people who are developing products. I think if you're looking at PR in general, uh, to hire a PR professional takes money. At the point that you're at where you might be looking for an industrial designer or getting ready to patent, that's where you want to allocate your money at the time. That doesn't mean, though, that if you are really studious about what you're trying to do, there isn't a place to perhaps have PR, i.e., uh, I have a client that's looking for a distributor of his product, and, but he's not ready with the product yet. But he knows he wants to not be ready to market and then figure it out. So he's attending trade shows. You could send out a press release uh, within the magazines for a particular trade show industry looking for a distributor. Product will be launched in January. Uh, there's an opportunity to use PR in the pre-product phase. So I think it's a matter of understanding your budget, where you want to allocate it, and when, and what your product is. And think about maybe Facebook. When Facebook was out, they had half a million, half a billion users worldwide. But what were they promoting? They were promoting their IPO. That might not be a good example, but they were selling the IPO. You want to sell a distributorship opportunity. You want to sell if the patent is about to be issued. Whatever it is, I think you have to define what part of your product you're PR in. And I also, I also think it's important to, in your product design, you know, think about how you're going to market it down the road with the name, with the color strategy, with you know, thinking about who your actual target demographic is, doing some focus groups, doing some research in advance so that when the product is ready, it's perfect for the market that's out there that want that would potentially want it. Um, Do you see any benefit to starting a website when your product is not ready? And I know I've done some web searches for a product and it says coming soon. Sure. And I sometimes say, so what? How good is it going to be? There's no information on it yet. And I have a negative approach. Well, mine says that it just says for licensing opportunities to contact. I mean, because then that could be a partnership in the future. I think that the longer you have your URL up, the better it's going to be for your SEO. Um, and I think the likelihood that you're going to find your website, if it's just a URL that you bought and it's just coming soon, not that high. I don't know what kind of searches you do that you find a lot of those. Um, but, you know, I also think that you should have it kind of all ready to go before you, you launch. Um, and your URL can be so important. Um, but you can always have many. You know, you can have 10 websites all linked back to the same site. Or 10, 10 URLs. Um, and that can also help, right? If you want to market to different countries, different languages. Um, 
maybe there's maybe you have two products within your brand and one appeals to one type of person and one appeals to a different type of person. Maybe you want to have two different URLs for those sites. Um, I guess I'm talking about provision also because I've gone back to a couple of those sites like three months later. Still not still not <laughs> well, I mean, websites, you know, usually take people a lot longer than they think they're going to take them. So that's why that happens. You know, so work with a good web designer. Um, real quick example. Um, there's a website call, called Corinne's Corner. Okay, a friend of mine, her name's Corinne. She goes to Broadway shows and she reviews them. She started the website about 10 years ago. It's Corinne'sCorner.com. Her little site, her little side hobby kind of got popular. She had over one, over one million unique visitors per month kind of reading the reviews um, about her, her visits. She changed her URL to broadwayshowbiz.com and like overnight almost doubled her um, unique visitors um, by having that established base but then also being able to capture um, new people by having a really great URL. Um, and you can still, you know, you can always keep both of those URLs. So in that example with her first blog, how did she attract people in the first place? Like, she just blogged content. People. Yeah. Good content, yeah. Okay. Good content that people wanted to read that um, was engaging with videos and, and photos and how is she monetized? That? What? How is she monetized? Not very well. Oh. If anyone wants to do advertising for her, I'm sure she would like to <laughs> some help. Um, but with ads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it a negative not to have a website? I mean, you know, if, if you're a startup and you're trying to promote things and so on. I could answer that so many ways. Um, I think you should at least have like a business card type website that you know at least is yes here here's our company here's how you can contact us um, you know probably you know ten years ago everyone didn't have a website right it was this huge huge task and it was something that you would maybe expect to cost twenty thousand dollars a big undertaking today I mean it, you can get a website um, you know you, you should probably have one uh, ten years from now Will we have as many websites as we do? I don't know. I think they might be going away and being replaced by some of these other things. But um, but yes, you should have a URL that you can direct people to. It makes them feel like you're a real business, um, and it, it gives them some confidence that I don't know that you're valid. For, for a, I'm sorry. For a small like upcoming business, you don't have anything going yet. There's a great site called Launch Rock set up a website in like 30 minutes and do that it's coming and put your Facebook and Twitter. Also, for, for, for the it's coming, that's, that's just a, a content issue, right? So if you want to block um, all the issues that your product is going to solve, or, you know, I think of it, I don't know if anyone in here knows about Leap Motion, the product that just came out where you can control your computer just by using your hand. Right? And for the longest time, they kept telling you all about how awesome this product is going to be. It's coming soon. And they, they sold like a million of these things before they had even produced them just by getting people excited about the prospect of what this thing was going to do. And they had a great content up there. I know that my dad and I waited 10 months to be able to buy it. We kept going back to the website to learn about what this product was going to do. Now, you want to be safe with your this patentable technology that you don't post everything up there that is going to uh, possibly uh, yeah, hurt you in the long run. But you can talk about the issues and say, I've got this great product that I'm developing. I came up with it while walking my dog. Who has an ever faced insert issue here? People are going to return to see what else you have to say. I think that's the best way to have right? Get a bunch of pre sales. You don't have the product yet. That's, I mean, that's the brilliant way to craft one. I mean, but yeah, it, it depends on, you know, what, what the issue is. Is it, if it's that you don't want to be prolific and you don't maybe want to write content, um, 
you know, maybe you have someone do that for you, or you know, you just have a very simple, basic website just with your contact information. I have a question. You mentioned logos quite a bit. So does it make sense, like I was thinking of having um, a company logo and then also a logo for the actual product that's going to be sold? Is that okay? Or yeah. is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, are you going to have multiple products within your brand? Um, you're, not, you're not sure yet. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I was trying to, hopefully, but it's software. But yeah, sure. Yeah. I, think, I think that's... Okay. Not overdoing it. No. Okay. We'll protect them. If you have two different logos, it's two different trademarks, two different names. You might want to have the URL for your company name, the URL for your product name. Uh, but you know, to so the point of focus, you don't want to dilute one versus the other. Right. Think about where you're going to want to put your efforts. Okay. Thanks. And what your identity is going to be about. Okay. Dana, thank you very much. Thank you. We will take a short break, and I think, uh, Lewis? Yes, uh, Justin Lewis-White. Yeah, he, uh, our pitching panel person just walked in, so uh, give us a 10-minute break. We're going to set up for that, and you're all welcome to stay. <laughs>